Um, so we're uh, we're coming to you to today. Uh, we, like the rest of the country, have been you know experiencing a moment of protest and crisis, um, still reverberating out from the uh, murder of George Floyd by the police, and ongoing um, protests in all fifty states of the country um, against police brutality and racism. And you know this is a moment in time when. Everyone is looking for something to do. They're looking for, you know, uh, how do I do and say the right thing in this moment of uh, in this moment of increased uh, racial awareness and, and tension throughout the country. And uh, one of the one of the things that, that we've noticed this week is that uh, among among white people who are looking to uh, fit in now, there have been uh, like certain texts and books and, and films that are being sort of uh, prescribed for you to uh, deal or sort of cope with this current moment or, you know, say the right thing. White it, people have been given homework. Yes. Uh, you know, T, uh, T talked about it on uh, the episode we have with him. Uh, there, yeah, there's a lot of like reading lists out there. And one of the things on these reading lists has now shot up to the top of the New York Times bestseller list. It is a book called uh, White Fragility by an author called Robin DeAngelo. And, you know, I thought, hey, I'm white. I'm fragile. It's, <laughs> I'm a small uh, maybe bean. you should check this out. I'm a small, soft, I'm fragile a small bean. bean. Yeah. White fragility was the working title <laughs> of our book. <laughs> I'll just say to join us uh, to discuss uh, white fragility and uh, what, what to do, how to talk, how to think. We're joined by our friend Jen Pan, who uh, you may remember from the Joker episode, which was, you know, let's be honest, the film about white fragility. And <laughs> white male rage, as SNL uh, put it. And of course, uh, back from his sojourn among the Philistines, it is our colleague Virgil Texas. Thanks for having me, and me as well. So uh, we we all read like a like a chunk of this book. Uh, I, I I did the beginning, but like before we get into you know what's in the book, like what do we make overall about like this uh, like th th this concept of uh, not just white fragility, but like this moment of. These, these sort of prescriptions for like how to be a white ally, like how to how to think and how to talk about these things. And like they like this this whole slate of, like you said, like homework that's uh, been assigned to the country. Um, so, you know, for my part, um, the context in which I encountered white fragility is um, a few months ago. Um, I was I was assigned to review it for the New Republic. Um, in sort of the broader context of the diversity industry, which, you know, you guys are probably aware is this like massive, bloated $8 billion industry, which sort of encompasses like anti-racist trainings, sensitivity workshops, like cultural competency, um, implicit bias training. Um, and that is incidentally the industry in which this author of White Fragility, Robin D'Angelo works, right? And so I think that, you know, a kind of interesting component to the conversation is the fact that uh, there's kind of been this, you know, emerging body of literature that talks about how these diversity trainings don't work. Um, they don't reduce people's biases. They don't really make workplaces more diverse. Um, and in some weird cases, they even like make people's biases stronger. Um, so I think that's kind of important to keep in mind um, when you are thinking about, you know, Robin D'Angelo and white fragility and how her book is basically a documentation of how these trainings don't work. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. She is a diversity yeah. trainer. Right. And her case studies in this book is she goes around to people's workplaces and to their schools and talks to them about racism. And her whole thesis is that white people in the room become extremely uncomfortable. They don't like what they're hearing um, and they don't react well to her. Um, so maybe that's, you know, a way to kind of kick off like what it is that she's getting at. I, I think, too, one of the things that, like, kept jumping out at me when I was reading this is that she kept saying, like, I cannot uh, correct or deprogram my unconscious bias and feelings of racial superiority. I will, I will always be like this. I will always, um, you know, walk around with, you know, latent white supremacy and I'm like, then why am I listening to you? Like, why are you the, the anti-racist trainer? Because she, like, every other paragraph, she's like, look, I know about racism. Take it from me, a racist. <laughs> I, she doesn't do a very good job at justifying her anti-racist credentials, except that she can charge people $10,000 a session, a speaking session for it. I mean, like, for like a two-hour, like, it's better than podcaster money, the hourly rate. It's amazing. 
Yeah. And if you're never done being racist, then um, all you can do to work on yourself is, you know, kind of participate in these steps of self-improvement, which, of course, um, include buying her book and attending her seminars. Right. I mean, there's no there's no cure. There's a treatment you have to take all the time, always and keep right. paying her. I mean, I guess what was like uh, sort of sort of weird to me about this moment and, and, and the required reading as as represented here by Robin D'Angelo and, and White Fragility is that, you know, if, if we're in a moment where. Uh, white people are just, you know, once again, perpetually being like, damn, there's a lot of racism in this country. That's fucked up. Like, you know, why? why <laughs> how, what can I do? It's just like it would seem to me if you were if you like if you wanted to educate yourself, like maybe read a fucking history book. You know what I mean? Like read, read any history of the United States uh, yeah. like, or or any like actually like like black author who's written about like this. But like this is a. This is a white woman and like the, the, the whole thrust of it is through this kind of like corporate HR model where like every 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 sort of um, uh, sort of like field of um, inquiry or sort of tension that she's that she's uh, unpacking here is all like I'm, I'm just imagining sitting in like a, a windowless air conditioned room with a big whiteboard with someone like, you know, pointing at me. And, and the book begins this way with a, it just begins with like this. I'm just going to read a little bit. She says, I am a white woman. I am standing beside a black woman. We are facing a group of white people seated in front of us. We are in you see, work- a, you see a turtle on its back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's all this, um, yeah, Voight comp test for uh, racism. She says, uh, a script to a St. Vincent music <laughs> video. <laughs> we are in their workplace and have been hired by their employer to lead them in a dialogue about race. The room is filled with tension and charged with hostility. I have just presented a definition of racism that includes the acknowledgement that whites hold social and institutional power over people of color. A white man is pounding his fists on the table. As he pounds, he yells, a white person can't get a job anymore. I look around the room and see 40 employees, 38 of whom are white. Why is this white man so angry? Why is he being so careless about the impact of his anger? Why doesn't he notice the effect of this outburst is having on the few people of color in the room? Why are they all why, why are all the other white people either sitting in silent agreement with him or tuning out? I have after all only articulated a definition of racism. That white man's name, Marine Todd. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Penthouse, I never thought this would happen to me. She does a lot of hypotheticals that I am are well, not hypotheticals. She does a lot of anecdotes that I'm like, "Oh, come on." Like Yeah, that, um, that at another happen. place in the book, she says something like, "I just can't understand why these white people would react like this upon getting an opportunity <laughs> to learn about their racism. And that opportunity, of course, um, as you pointed out, Will, is in the workplace, um, which of course is something that she never bothers to um, not only just interrogate, but doesn't even acknowledge that, you know, mm-hmm. um, the context in which these trainings are unfolding is quite often, in her case, in the workplace, where, as we all know, there are uh, many different power dynamics already at work. Uh, the main one, of course, being between the bosses who organize such workshops and then everyone else who has yeah, to it's attend. Yeah, it's mandatory. The idea, why yeah. aren't you being open to me, the person that your fucking asshole boss paid to yell at you for an hour? Does, right. Does and she actually never address that? Never. No. Mm-hmm. Like, no. not once. It's, she never mentions that, like, this is a mandatory school assembly uh, where, where uh, your employer is now being invited to like <laughs> interrogate the most intimate parts of like your psyche and brain and experience right like Re- about a very politically charged topic like who the fuck wants their boss talking to them about yeah. racism yeah I don't. Can you guys give me some information that uh, certainly will not be put in your file for later use <laughs> right <laughs> yeah yeah you will not be punished well she mentions that too at one point she apparently made a joke about also i get the impression she is very weird around black. Oh, people. she has to be. And the sub. How could she not be? The, 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 the subtext of this book, too, that they never mention is that she's talking about black people. Like she says people of color, but she's not talking about like the ho chunk of Wisconsin or the Hmong of fucking Minnesota. She is talking about black people who, you know, have advanced degrees. And like, it's just it's just like a very weird thing. It's a black people. Please like me book. But like. At one point, she talks about being on a team doing an interview for a new web developer. The web developer's black, and the other two women on the on the team. She's never, by the way, clear about who's hiring who, who is the boss in this, who is anyone superior. That is apparently not relevant information. And she said, well, look, here's what we do. We do these anti-racist trainings. So that's what it is. And the, the woman was like, giving her like a survey and saying like, what do you want from my services? Because, you know, I 
I, I need to, I need information from you. And she's like, look, we do these anti-racist trainings. She's like, and people don't respond well to them. She cannot stop saying that enough. <laughs> she's just like, look, I'm bad at my job. Nobody likes me. I make people cry and angry all but the time. But they don't punch me because and, they'd get fired if they did. So it must be working. <laughs> yes, exactly. And uh, at, a, at, at another point, like uh, she said, uh, and, you know, one of, the, one of the people that we gave these trainings to uh, recently, for example, uh, was asked not to come back. She doesn't say fired. <laughs> she said they were asked not to come back. And well, then she said he was scared of, uh, you know, so-and-so's uh, hair. And it was like a woman who had, like, box braids or something. He went and to an anti-racist black- farm upstate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the, the, she tries to make sort of a joke to this woman that she just met. And she's like, yeah, they were scared of her hair. You know how you guys have different hair? And, it, and like the woman like later points out this makes her, she says to another person that this made her uncomfortable. She's like, I don't know yeah. you. you. You have not been invited to the cookout. We don't have that kind of relationship. And she does a big thing where she atones and she pulls the woman aside. And she's like, I would like to apologize and, and work through the racism that I did to you. Would you be amenable to that? And again, she never mentions if this woman is her employer or not, but they think she is. I think she is. I think she is her inferior. So she's not going to be like, no, bitch, leave me alone. Well, even if she wasn't inferior, like like, there's a certain level which you have to humor people in a workplace. uh, And and all of this stuff is built in the premise of we all have to get along. And the way we're going to get along is if we're all afraid of getting fired at any moment. We should treat life like we are under the watch of HR at all the times. Like at one point, at well, one point she are. quotes, no person of color whom I've met has said racism isn't at play with his or her friendships with white people. And you'd think, that sounds sucky. Why would you be friends with somebody who, like, there's always this racial tension? Well, if you work with them and you don't really have a choice but to have some sort of modus vivendi with them, that's true. Yes. If you, that's the, and those are the only interracial friendships she can imagine are ones that are essentially compulsory yes. because they take place in the workplace. Yeah, That's and like, a consistent thing is that she does not know what yeah. friends are. Like, I figured that out very early, and I'm like, oh, you don't have Yeah, she has another friends. quote here. You have, you have If colleagues. racism is not a topic of discussion between a white person and a person of color who are friends, this absence of conversation may indicate a lack of cross-racial trust. And it's like, maybe, but it could also represent an abundance of trust and, because it's not something that comes up. That's possible. That's, that's, that, like, that's not I impossible, mean, but in her mind, that is precluded because once again she's imagining all these relationships in the quasi in the in the quasi compulsory context of employer uh, relations love to talk about racism all day with my poc friends well i mean th- this reminds me of like again we're, we're talking about these sort of like prescriptions these, these these bullet points that are being offered now uh directed at white people like you know during during a a time in this country that you know is 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 fraught with you know anger trauma uh, anxiety over like the you know uh, horrendous state of uh, the world and like the one, the one of them that I remember was like you know uh, white people um, like check in with your black friends and coworkers and just be like hey are you okay like how are you doing right now are you are like are, are you uh, like just what are your emotions like right now at the, in, during this time of uh, like anger and 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 tr- and trauma and it's just like well if they were your friend. Uh, you would be generally aware of what's going on in their life yeah. in the first place. And Russ. if they're not your friend, if they're just your coworker, like keep that <laughs> shit to yourself. They don't want to hear that from you. Like they don't want to just like yeah. leering over their, your fucking shoulder to just be like, are you OK? You know what I mean? Oh, like, I mean, I was reading this over and over again. And after like it, I, making myself laugh because I was high that after every paragraph, I just kept saying, ma'am, this is a Wendy's. Because it's the most, uh, like, strange sort of environment that she completely decontextualizes. Like, she doesn't talk about the fact that this is work, that she makes her money from selling these services and these programs and models. And the subtext is, of course, that this is all to, one, lower liability for corporations for discrimination, and two, make it easier to fire people. Yeah, just have something else, uh, some some problem relationship, some issue that can be then used as as, uh, as cause. Except it's not a Wendy's ever, of course. It's Unilever. It's Amazon. Um, I'm sure she'll do something for Exxon Mobil at some point. But like, 
it's all like universities and like major corporations that she does this for. Well, what about like the, the title of the book, uh, White Fragility, which she claims, you know, she coined this term. So like, what, what is she talking about? What does she mean when she says you're bragging fragility? about that? Yeah. And what she means is uh, like, like the, the fragility comes from like the the discomfort, the anger, the resentment that occurs when like any, ever a, a white person is asked to confront uh, you know, their place in America's racial hierarchy or uh, what race means in general and or like that they might in some way be complicit in racism. And she writes here, these include emotions such as anger, fear and guilt and behaviors such as argumentation, silence and withdrawal from the stress inducing situation. These responses work to reinstate white equilibrium as they repel the challenge, return our racial comfort and maintain our dominance within the racial hierarchy. I conceptualize this process as white fragility. The white fragility is triggered by discomfort and anxiety. It is born of superiority and entitlement. White fragility is not weakness per se. In fact, it is a powerful means of white racial control and the protection of white advantage. And when I read that, I was just like, oh, white fragility is like when an armadillo plays dead. You know, it's just it, it's a way of like uh, escaping uh, a, like a dangerous situation. And like the thing is, in reading this book, she she writes over and over again about like the importance of uh, if you're a white person reading this to like to really feel the discomfort that like, you know, these concepts and my ideas are, are, are causing you and to just sort of stay with that, stay in that moment of discomfort. And I was like, to, well, to, by the way, and this is the phrase she uses in order to build your and this is a term she uses racial stamina, <laughs> which sounds a lot like racial hygiene to me. Uh, Chris, could we could we work in a little bit of tomorrow belongs to me for that? I just I I don't I'm not one of those mm, optics people, but the phrase racial stamina is a bit ubermatch. No, it's a little the Rhine gives its gold to the it's sea. It's fine. It's she's just saying that you got to work up your race stamina to do the race marathon, and if you oppress yourself, you will get a race high. Eventually, race stamina is really more of a dump stat. You should put more into race intelligence or race strength. <laughs> race charisma. Race seems like wanna, if you want to, if you want to min max. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but on the on the concept of white fragility, I mean, obviously whites are fragile and they need to be uh, wrapped in old newspaper when you move <laughs> apartments. But uh, I swear, I only read three chapters of the book, and all the chapters are very very short. And I swear, just even within those three chapters, she defines the concept of white fragility about a dozen times with a different definition each time. Like she's describing different aspects of the same God. Yeah. No, it's like, it's like astrology. It's everything. It's just, it's just a lens for yeah, looking it's, at it's things. It's samsara. Yeah. She's, she's really also just like packing in the word, word count there. Like there is, it's, it's very, very repetitious because yeah, it's not a, that, and like in, I, I read three chapters of it as well. And I was just thinking of like, you know, her, um, her admonition that like I, I remain uncomfortable reading it and to that extent like you know she was very successful in writing this book but like my discomfort stemmed from my like my just dumbfounded boredom of just reading again very repetitive material over and over again but I suppose that's kind of the point it has to be sort of driven home and just that I, I made this note here this is at the end of the introduction and I think this gets to the kind of the nut of what she's going for she writes here uh, this book is intended for us for white progressives who so often, despite our conscious intentions, make life so difficult for people of color. I believe that white progressives cause the most daily damage to people of color. And then she goes on here, none of our energy will go into what we need to be doing for the rest of our lives, engaging in ongoing self-awareness, continuing education, relationship building, and actual anti-racist practice. And I, I think this is where she gets in is like, this is like this kind of it's like this this self-fulfilling mechanism of people with her job is just like, hey, yeah. hey, you don't want to be fragile. Well, the way out of it is to like continue to do the work and you continue to do the work by, again, hiring me, buying these books, continuing to do these things. And the fact that it's saying like white progressives, this is aimed at you. You are actually the worst of all yep. is to just like, oh, well, it couldn't be me. Oh, oh no. Yeah. This book is a brochure yeah. for her services. Yeah. No, it's, like, it's you know, absolutely she, the fact uh, that she's aiming white. it directly at the heart of uh, like anxious white progressives is like that's that's her easy mark that she's going for here. Yeah. Specifically women. The other thing is that nothing that she prescribes, um, which you just laid out, Will, like educating yourself, sitting with your discomfort, uh, making bullet lists or whatever. 
Um, none of that is anything. That's not anti-racist yeah. action. Like uh, as the old saying goes, that and a dollar will get you a cup of coffee, you know? Yeah. Well, that the idea behind all this stuff is that these is that racism is foundational and, and cannot be removed. All it can be do, done is ameliorated at a personal level. It's like original sin. You can only be atoned for, but then you have to keep atoning. You have to continually atone because you will continually sin because nothing can change. And so it's asking, and, and the thing is, is that that is a persuasive thing for a certain class of highly educated person for whom uh, the, the uh, injustice of society is some sort of a psychic uh, uh, burden. This is a way for them to alleviate that burden. But it's a way to alleviate that burden in a context where they never have to relinquish any of their material advantage. It sucks that like people are being taught that, by the way, anti-racism, very painful. You're going to cry. You're not going to like it. And it's like, well, then why would they do? Well, that's just it. <laughs> is that it's assuming an audience. She says that she pitches this to progressive uh, whites for a reason. They're the only people who would see this deal and say, uh, sure, and not fuck off. No, no, thank you. Yeah, just like just like in the medieval, just like in the Victorian era, it was only uh, bored rich people who would go to. Uh, you know, uh, Professor Graham's uh, vitality clinic and have yogurt jammed up their ass and uh, and uh, uh, fucking graham crackers put in their urethra because everyone else is like, that's insane. You have to have bought into the premise already. And that is why it's nihilistic, because it assumes, yeah, of course, most white people are going to say, what's in it for me? Because that's how people act about anything. That's why that's why meaningful anti-racist action is is class based because it, it gives everybody a stake in changing things for the better. Whereas this just gives you a stake in feeling better about how bad things are always going to be. And not getting fired. Yeah. Uh, reading this book, uh, she, she, she does stress over and over again that like for, for, for white people, like the, the, the beginnings of this journey begin with you being like sort of hyper aware of you as a member of the white race and what that means. And it honestly, it really reminded me of uh, on the Howard Stern show used to have this KKK guy call in and his sort of catchphrase would always be wake up what people. And I just think like I, I just read this book as the anti-racist version of that where it was just attention what people like just you are white like, you know, you know, getting around it like, you yeah. know, so just you better start thinking about that of yourself in those terms all the time because everyone else is. It, and like, you know, that's how like, you know, that is your destiny. That is the future is just you as like a white person. And that and like and that's it. And she thinks that's she, fine. She uses the she, she thinks it's good. She uses the phrase fellow whites, which hello, fellow white. Yeah. Like, <laughs> she thinks that's fine over because and over again. She's uh, imagining that her audience are people who are so fucking comfortable that this rate that thinking of themselves as white can only have positive uh, uh, impacts. Whereas in a reality of steadily and declining standards of living for everybody in this country, racial awareness is the last thing people fucking need. Yeah, uh, historically speaking, uh, elites developing a white identity has not been good for people of color. No, and and but like I mean I don't know like going through this book like the I, I read the introduction and like the first chapter which is like the broad overview and then like her second her second chapter is, is about like is about white supremacy and sort of like how race is socially constructed and then the third chapter is about like the evolution of racism like post civil rights movement and broadly speaking like you know she she makes the point that uh, like a lot of the way like most white people think of race in this racism in this country is like well that happened in the past. Or, you know, it's just like they think of Bull Connor unleashing dogs on people or like the Ku Klux Klan or things like that. But like regard that like, you know, the, the contemporary world is that settled and like everything is sort of an objective equal playing field right now. And that bringing it up or being made aware of it is in and of itself racist, which I guess like, you know, like individually, I don't think she's wrong in that like. Most people's understanding, I'm just saying like most people like, don't know shit about American history in the first place and, you know, do react like poorly when they seem to like when they are made to feel like implicated in a history of uh, racism or white supremacy yeah. in this country. But but her whole thing is it's like she's like, well, white it, you know, white liberals have so much trouble talking about racism. Clearly, they don't. So they love they love talking about racism endlessly they fucking talk about racism you see constantly. those libs doing that video they didn't have to do that nobody made them do that Wait, what the lib video the the apology video all the celebs oh yeah yeah they love that shit like yeah. it's clearly like that's just something they did because they were bored like, yeah. <laughs> it's almost like a hobby for them uh I, I don't think they're particularly like 
smart about it or doing anything productive. But clearly, they like talk. White libs like talking about racism and how it's bad. Gloria Reed calls that post post racialism. Um, this kind of like condition where, as you say, like white liberals um, or I guess liberals of all sorts um, sort of set up. I don't know if I would call it a straw man, but they sort of invoke this concept of post-racialism to be like, well, that's not me. And we really need to talk about race. Um, but as you pointed out, they they are talking about race all the time. Um, and once again, Robin DiAngelo's uh, paycheck is contingent upon talking about race. So it behooves her to kind of set up the situation where um, nobody but her is talking about race. So uh, I, like I said, I only read the like the introduction in the first three chapters of this book, but uh, like where where else does this go? Because it just seems to me like the the book is essentially just the introduction in the first chapter where she lays out like what her program is and, you know, why you should hire her. But like what else is in this book? She gives like a list of like things that you as like a good white ally can feel and say when some, when you're you're told in one of these workshops that you're reproducing racism. Those include gratitude, motivation, excitement, <laughs> humility, compassion. Um, and then some of the things you can say uh, when you're you know confronted uh, by by your racism is, I appreciate this feedback. This is very helpful. It's my responsibility to resist defensiveness and complacency. <laughs> this is hard, but also stimulating and important, and so on yes, and so you forth. you know, how people talk. Like, he, normal <laughs> humans, right. normal humans just having right. uh, how they talk. I, 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 I feel like you, you, you mentioned it before, Amber, you brought it up where it's like she gives a, an example from her own life where she, uh, you know, m made a, 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 a black woman co-worker feel, unco or not even co-worker, it's not even defined what their relationship is. She made someone feel uncomfortable and then had to make a, 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 a sort of a tone for it, but first she had to ask if that person was okay with her making amends for it. And like that whole dialogue, I was trying to like put my finger on like what it reminded me of. And the first thought I had was uh, like data from Star Trek, the next generation trying to like relate to, to learning a new concept about humanity. But then I realized that that was like really unkind to data who was way more tactful and like aware than uh, this person was. Well, right. data wasn't trying to sell something. D data was more human than this woman. Um, she does uh, like talk about how it's wrong to like want basic trust. And she says like whites demand comfort they think that um, uh, an essential measure of trust is to be nice. And she says, and according to dominant white norms, and it's like, is there a, a different definition of nice? Is there, are there racial <laughs> definitions? Like, first of all, you, you should be nice. I don't, I don't know how that's controversial. Like, I, be, be nice. It's a, you know, it's a yeah, bumper, so it's if, a bumper if, you wanted, if you actually wanted to get across an idea to somebody you don't know, being nice is a good way to start. The idea that, yeah. well, they should accept the, the abrasiveness. They should accept confrontation because it's the only way they're going to learn. They haven't learned it that yet, though. They, they have, have to be butted. And that's where the implicit coercion comes in, because imagine, none of this would make sense imagine, if the person could leave the room. It only makes sense if they get fired, if they leave the room. Imagine saying that you would approach any other kind of education in this way where it's like, you piece of shit, third graders, you're learning long division today. It's not the ideal conditions for learning. No, I, I don't. Think, uh, I, she's telling people to sort of like resist their basic desire for like human amity or because, whatever. Because of the, my favorite line of the book actually isn't from her. It's from Michael Eric Dyson's intro where he says this, oh quote, Robin D'Angelo is the new racial sheriff in town. <laughs> oh she is bringing a different law and order to bear upon the racial proceedings. <laughs> She is dropping the throwdown gun of compassion on the bullet riddled corpse of discrimination. <laughs> I mean, but that's yeah, it. It's, it's just, all coercive. The idea is everyone has got a gun to their head at all times. All like, it's and all then, then we're all going to treat each other nicely. Not because we actually feel that way, but because we're afraid of the alternative. And I don't yeah, know about you guys, but that sounds like a harmonious social order. That's like the NRA's idea of a polite society. <laughs> yeah. It's all just sort no of dance. like psycho, psycho cult shit, which um, I think is intended to sort of justify the fact that people are being subjected to something. It's, it's to, to smash down, like, basically the human instinct uh, to be like, this seems weird. Um, and they, she says at some point, like, uh, you have to let go of the messenger and focus on them on them message it's an advanced skill and it's like well some messengers are 
uh, full of shit and there are conflicting messages. There's, you know, not one big, you know, black people summit where they all agree on what the, the, the correct line on something is. You kind of have to actually, the messenger is a very essential part of the whole thing. Like, it's just, it's, it's, she's trying to deprogram basic human behavior for what I truly believe is like an insidious design for like PMC sort of uh, employee compliancy and complacency. And then any, and then any like pushback to that, she takes as more evidence of the persistence of white fragility, which again is awfully convenient for her. Yeah, I'm not bad at my job. They're just awful. Uh, yeah, Amber, you you mentioned it, but I I, I do have a a sneaking suspicion. That, like I I worry that the overall purpose of things in, like as best embodied by by this woman in this book, like serves sort of two functions at least as far as a professional role goes, which is like one is to justify the need for more you know counseling you know sessions like this, and the other I think like well what are the what are the people who hire her get out of it like the, these corporations. And I think like the the really insidious thing is I think what they get is like a very covert form of like um, union busting and kind of like mm-hmm. a- anti solidarity yeah. in a way. It's just it's kind of like let let's do, like, 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 let's sort of like make all our employees as hyper aware as possible of these like uh, sort of like this this racial anxiety and paranoia so that they're like they, they never feel like they're part of a kind of a shared struggle or like a mission, which is would be actual like anti-racist practice is investing people in a in a shared struggle that you work towards together to better everyone's life is because like that when you're invested in that in, in like a, in, in something like that, I think that is what does do the, the work that this person is supposedly trying to sell you on, which is like, you know, I don't know, realizing a common humanity or like a or dis- you know dissolving those differences rather than you know pe- making people sort of hyper aware and like I said instilling a kind of uh, like a constant paranoia about it not just for white people but I would imagine uh, if you are one of the three black employees that she mentions in these in these companies I mean like I would imagine like after God. one of these things like you're you're not exactly going to feel uh, totally like you know warm and uh, you know. You're not going to feel exactly um, completely at ease with your white coworkers when they line up to fucking like a- ask, you know, do a wellness check on you at, after lunch. And like say how racist they are. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. The author seems to not recognize what her actual job is uh, as someone who, you know, goes to Fortune 500 companies to uh, insulate them from legal liability when an employee does the Chris Rock routine. <laughs> <laughs> she keeps saying things like uh, in her anecdotes, uh, uh, framing them as this company brought me in to foster di- uh, diversity. And it's like that. No, <laughs> they didn't do that. That's never happened. Yeah, yeah she, she doesn't. She, she never uses words like hired or fired. She never uses like you know, boss, employee, she avoids that completely. And I can't tell, virtually you might be right. Like for the whole time, I'm like, oh, she's trying to obfuscate this, but she's so weird and doesn't know how to talk to people that she might not know what her job is. And she's been an academic her entire life. Yeah, so her job is fake. Um, (laughs) Did any of you, or which of you got the section where she's talking about like white women crying and she's like- I was just going to ask. Okay, she's like, she's like, like, "When when I need to cry, I do it quietly and I go in a corner and I don't let anyone console me it's like, holy <laughs> what? shit. Also, by the way, yes, she literally says, like, white women don't cry. She, but also she says, look, I make women cry a lot. and But they shouldn't do that. And it's like, I just feel like maybe you're doing a bad job if you're making people cry at work. There's no crying in race ball, okay? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, very good. She says that uh, it's actually killing black people when white women cry like and then she brings up Emmett Till like you are literally putting black people's lives in danger which actually indicts her because she is making them cry so it's like (laughs) bitch you are killing black people stop making white women cry it's dangerous there I mean the white women are just like a single gun you're like the NRA for fuck's sake it's a controlled (laughs) demolition I think is the way she would think of it well, okay, but I wanted to talk, like, just go back real quick. We should, we'll talk more about white woman's tears because this thing is insane. But Will mentioned um, sowing paranoia, which is like a constant thing in this book over and over again, not just where you're being, like, surveilled and moderated, 
but also she creates like this like ghost POC that can see deep into your subconscious and see all your badness. She says like, you know, you have racist patterns. That's just patterns. called God, Amber. <laughs> you have, that's called black Jesus. Uh, you have racist patterns and POC know you have them, which is like this weird combo of like white liberal narcissism where you flatter yourself by like, Everyone's Imagine, thinking of you at all the yeah, time. Yeah, and POC are just thinking about you all the time. They have no, they have no internal lives outside of racism. And then also kind of like this weird kind of mystical belief in like that like melanin makes people clairvoyant or something. Like it's like a very weird like they're thinking of you. So it does make you feel like not only are you being surveilled by your boss, but by all the POC, by the POC hive mind who can read your thought. Yeah, because a panopticon is the only way to enforce this thing. If everyone is always under surveillance, everyone can always be judged and, and, and ticketed for racial transgressions, they will never transgress. But of course, yeah, they will also never change the views. But that's because these people don't think that's possible. They don't think that those things emer emerge from uh, malleable and, and changeable uh, systems of systematic and, and structural oppression. I mean, uh, Amazon has an algorithm for detecting which of their Whole Foods locations is most likely to be a, a potential labor trouble spot. Uh, and one of the things that they look for is lack of diversity because the less because diver diversity is a div can be a dividing tactic by management. They, they mm. can they can drop the white frailty bomb if it looks like they're get the they're talking too much uh, with each other about about organizing. It's like, oh, right. you guys, you guys really want to. Wow. You guys think you have. You guys want to organize together, even with this Karen against us who care about race and, and, had, and made you do the mandatory uh, racial awareness seminar? You, you, you're going to let all these Karens dictate what, what should be going on here just because they want to form yeah. a union? Yeah, well, uh, and also, like, in this situation, diversity is very euphemistic. What I bet a lot of what they're talking about is things like language barriers. Yeah, but like anything that, that can be used, anything can be used as a lever, as a wedge. Yeah. And because they have they, they control the way that they control what the what the racial policy and politics and the the atmosphere are through their human relations, uh, human resources uh, department so that they, they could basically like stoke or uh, stoke at their discretion whenever they want people to get really tense about race to their own. Ends. So so we've learned that um, that that white women should absolutely not cry. And if they do cry, there should be some sort of crying pod, perhaps um, uh, provided by the employer, like sort of like those uh, sort of like those breast breastfeeding shacks that they have at airports. Yeah. Now, they should have one those for those for white women's tears in uh, every workplace and home. And quite frankly, you know, I'm in favor of that. I'm, I'm, I'm sick. I'm sick of these bras and their emotions <laughs> to keep that away from me, ladies. I'm imagining uh, uh, one of her one of her seminars is like the end of Terminator 2, where they where they they they, they slowly lower white fragility into a, into like a molten uh, blast furnace. And then she goes, now I know why you cry. <laughs> but it's something I can never do as a white woman <laughs> <laughs> or, or something I should never do as a white as woman. a white woman. She goes uh, underneath the lava and then cries under the lava, so you can't see. Literally it. kills black people. Uh, so, what about like the the middle chunk of the book, uh, Matt Virgil? What 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 did what did you learn from uh, your sections of the book? I I learned uh, that white frailty uh, is is a varied. Uh, it's it's a land of contrast, and basically <laughs> anything can be white frailty. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, all all interactions are infused with it. It cannot be divorced from any. Behavior, it's an inerrant, inherent and in, in, instinctual at this point in all white people uh, and that it, it can only be neutralized in a moment through basically a full mental concentration on race every t and, and the entire history of race in America every time you encounter a, a, a black person because it is about, as Amber says, it's not really about minorities or any kind of like racial diversity. It's specifically about black people. Uh, and, and that the only way to interact with the black people in your life who are implied but never stated outright, all coworkers or employees in her imagining, uh, is to just have a forehand throbbing at every moment to remember the entire history of racial oppression in this country and your specific uh, uh, beneficiary, the fact that you're a beneficiary of it. There, there is a, the thing that I found most uh, interesting, though, is that she, she keeps things so elastic in that 
in that way that like horoscopes are elastic so that everything in your life can be filtered through it and found to be uh, uh, descriptive of it uh, because mm -hmm. of it's so broad a brush. Uh, at one point, she's, she's talking about the need for white people to acknowledge their privilege and how white people resist acknowledging their privilege because they don't imagine themselves to have privilege. Uh, and that they have, but that that's not true. And that, and then she rejects the idea that uh, privilege is something that white people have but aren't aware of. She says, "No, no, you are aware of it." She she says she quotes some other race theorist as saying that white people saying that they're uh, unaware of racism uh, or or of their privilege. It's like if someone walked by them and just stuffed money into their pockets, they wouldn't be able to notice that, which is an insane comparison. Because otherwise, she stresses that these things, that these notions of white superiority are embedded from like childhood, and people get them by age three. And yet, she then, at the same, uh, in the same breath, says, "No, you should be hyper aware of them at all moment. And if you aren't, it's because you're you are being selfish and you're being racist." Even though, by her own architecture, these things are like deeply embedded psychological concepts, but in her mind, it's as obvious as someone literally putting money in your pocket which does not make sense at all. It's what it is in the moment that justifies, like we've said, reading the book and going to the seminars and, and eat, using the uh, nootropics that I'm sure she, the anti-racism nootropics she's going to start selling. I would not be surprised if she started selling anti-racism nootropics off this shit. Like, my new stack will uh, reduce the racism uh, lobe in your brain by 20% and increase your... Uh, your uh, anti-racist uh, folds in your cerebrum. <laughs> well, you know what I think it's it's going to end up being, and I wait for it because I, 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 I want to see the Vegas odds on this. In order, I mean, right now this is like Scientology, where you abuse people into saying that they're bad, and then they, um, and then they come out um, compliant, and you can do whatever you want with them. But what I think she's going to do is sell racist training workshops, where it's like, uh, like. Yoga in America is not lucrative, but you know what is like lucrative? It's not lucrative to be a yoga teacher unless you're like a like you have like a personal client that pays you five hundred dollars a session. What is uh, lucrative is the schools to teach yoga teachers. So I think she is probably going to branch out from this by training more anti-racist trainers and make it a full multi-level marketing scheme. There's still going to be level marketing. It, multi MLM is a good model. <laughs> Uh, I like to think that uh, her next move is uh, to sell DVDs where, you know, you, you do the anti-racism moves at home while watching <laughs> her do them. Uh, and something like an anti-racism Bowflex, which I'm kind of picturing as a crash test dummy. That's like a person of color that, you know, it, and you do you put in the DVD and, you know, you follow along with your your crash test dummy uh figuring out how to talk to them how to use human language <laughs> yeah <laughs> mlm is a good model too though yeah. yeah for sure i mean that's all that's left everyone's selling each other mlms that's it that's the only mm -hmm. growth energy in the economy now yeah amber like and sort of the brilliant thing <laughs> is that like e even her own writing sort of acknowledges that like uh doing these things also actually does perpetuate racism and white fragility even in like being aware or talking about them so it's like a totally vertically integrated system yeah where it's like you create the racism in america first you create the racism then you yeah, create yeah, the yeah. anti-racism then yeah. you get the money then you get the power what is that not synergy um the vertical thing. integration vertical integration yeah. yes she's making people more racist that they have to buy their anti-racism shit yeah genius she's a we, genius we, honestly we have no choice but to stand yeah an entrepreneurial legend yeah uh well Vir virgil were there were there were any any anything from your section of note uh yeah there were a few interesting things uh some of which we already talked about because uh you know she peppers uh, her text and the text is very slim with these anecdotes about doing the workshop and people being indignant about it, which I thought was just my section. But apparently, the, just the whole book is. Like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, if this, if she, if she had taken a, a single screenwriting class, she'd know that this is where the rising action should be, uh, chapters seven through nine. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I just couldn't get over the fact that she's not making this connection that. Everyone she talks to is like fuck off, <laughs> where they're attending these paid mandatory services. It's like that. It's like that line that you know, uh, if 
everyone you meet is an asshole. Well, then it turns out you're the asshole. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's like, like she can't grok the idea that you might be indignant about getting written up because you did a racism <laughs> and that, you know, why wouldn't you be indignant? It's literally a punishment having to talk to this person. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't a punishment is precisely what someone says when they are punishing you. <laughs> yeah. That's, yep. Virgil, it's for your I, own I, good. I, you got to stay in your room all afternoon. It's uh, not okay, a punishment. So there, okay, so there's two interesting things for my, my section. Uh, first, I just, first, this paragraph was just funny to me. Uh, <clears throat> capital can shift with the field. For example, when the custodian, oh, this is in the context of this mangled discussion of Borgia. Uh, capital can shift with the field. For example, when the custodian comes upstairs to speak to the receptionist, the custodian work clothes and the receptionist in business attire, the office worker has more capital than does the maintenance person. But when the receptionist goes down, that's in quotation marks, to the supply room, which the custodian controls to request more whiteboard markers, those power lines shift. This is the domain of the custodian <laughs> who can fulfill the request quickly or can make the transaction difficult. The domain of the custodian what? is a level 40 dungeon. Do not go in <laughs> unless you have multiple healing spells and a resurrect. Uh, but yeah, it's like, oh, I, I, I guess in this kind of genre of book, a lot of it is just kind of like bad readings of Borgia because like her in her mind, uh, Habitus is a kind of uh, racial equilibrium. And when it's disturbed by a person of color asserting their humanity or a brave um, anti-racism consultant, klaxons go off and a white fragility happens and maintenance droids are summoned to repair the hull bridge. Uh, that's, you know, again, that's another definition of white fragility that just appears in my chapter. Uh, okay, I have this long anecdote that I think you'll all enjoy. This comes from... Chapter 9, White Fragility in Action. So this is the climax. This is where the action happens. This is like the big chase sequence. (laughs) I was leading a community workshop. Because an employer had not sponsored it, the participants had all voluntarily signed up and paid a fee to attend. For this reason, we could assume that they were open and interested in the content. We could also assume that they're complete sociopaths. They're freaks. (laughs) Yeah. I was working with a small group of white participants. When a woman I will refer to as Ava stated that because she grew up in Germany, where there, she said there were no black people, it's false, by the way, she had learned nothing about race and held no racism. I pushed back on this claim by asking her to reflect on the messages she had received from her childhood about people who lived in Africa. Surely she was aware of Africa, had some impressions of the people there. Had she ever watched American films? I also asked her to reflect on what she had absorbed from living in the U.S. for the last 23 years, whether she had relationships with African-Americans here, and if not, why not? We moved on, and I forgot about the interaction until she approached me after the workshop ended. She was furious and uh, said that she had been deeply offended by our exchange and did not, quote, feel seen. You made assumptions about me, she said. I apologized, and I told her I would never want her to feel unseen or invalidated. However, I also held up to my challenge that growing up in Germany would not preclude her from absorbing problematic racial messages. She countered by telling me that she had never even seen a black person before the American soldiers came. And when they did come, all the German women thought they thought them so beautiful that they wanted to connect with them. That was her evidence that she held no racism. With an internal sigh of defeat, I gave up at that point and repeated my apology. We parted ways, but her anger was unabated. A few months later, one of my co-facilitators contacted Ava to tell her about an upcoming workshop. Ava was apparently still angry. She replied that she would never again attend a workshop by me. Uh, So I I, I, I just want to pause and ask how many white fragility workshops is this person (laughs) attending just on a monthly basis? Yeah, this is this is like one of those people that just spends their money on improv classes. And it's like you're not getting on SNL. It's not going to happen. It is kind of like an improv class, isn't it? I mean, there are games. Yeah. There's yeah. structure to it. Yeah, give me a POC. Uh, give me an a, a, a axis of oppression. Uh, but on the flip side of that, if you're sending out these promotions to people who have already attended the White Fragility Workshop, aren't you admitting the workshop doesn't work? <laughs> it has to be constantly reinforced. It's not like there's new scientific developments in the field of uh, white fragility. That's like, you know, come, it's like 80% new content. <laughs> See, but well, that's just it because it has, it has to be reinforced because you have these ingrained things that are beyond conscious and they have to be expert, extirpated repeatedly. You have to keep reminding yourself. And that's why I think that she's eventually going to get a new tropic because – what if you're on the go and you don't have time? You want to get rid of racism, but you can't go to a monthly uh, session. You know, just pop a pill every day, and you'll be you'll have the same anti-racism 
uh, anti anti racist antioxidants going through your system. Oh yeah, uh, I just wanted to uh, finish out this. Um, it's uh, uh, she diagrams uh, her interactions with Ava. Let's start with the common emotional reactions that white people have, and that Ava demonstrated when our assumptions and behaviors are challenged. Feelings singled out, attacked, silenced, shamed, guilty, accused, insulted, judged, angry, scared, outraged. The Will Menneker experience. <laughs> when, <laughs> when we have these feelings, it is common to behave in the following ways as Ava did. Crying, physically leaving, emotionally withdrawing, arguing, denying, focusing on intentions, seeking absolution, avoiding. The Will Menneker girlfriend experience. <laughs> I was going to say the Will Medicare managerial style, but yeah, <laughs> no, that works too. That works too. I guess just like, in, I mean, like for me, like just to echo what you said, Virgil, like there, there's a, there's a part in, uh, in, in the, in the introduction of the book where again, just to underscore this idea that like she's, she's routinely shocked and taken aback just how, just how often people really don't like attending her, her seminars or talking to her. And she says here, the very idea that they would be required to attend a workshop on racism outraged them. They entered the room angry and made that feeling clear to us throughout the day as they slammed their notebooks down on the table, refused to participate in exercises, and argued against any and all points. I couldn't understand their resentment or disinterest in learning more about such a complex social dynamic as racism. And my note there is like, yeah, I I, it just fundamentally back, back again to our original point, I can't imagine why anyone would resent having to do this as part of their fucking office hours of shit they have to do. Like They probably have emails they have to answer and shit that they're probably freaking out about. They got to spend two, two hours where it's just like, Yes, racism is is this like is this horrible like intractable problem in our society, but it is so weird that like we're coming up with like the medium through which we are going to deal with this finally is the office. You shit that you have to do at work, which is just like that. I, I can't help but feel it's just a recipe for disaster. Oh yeah, well I mean it's designed. It's not designed to do anything about racism too. Uh, yeah. But like this is the kid. I realized that we all hated who would ask for more homework <laughs> and then, and then would be shocked when people are like, why do we have to do this extra thing? I don't, she's like, no, it's fun. We're getting, we're getting better at math. <laughs> but like the idea of this being outsourced to has a secondary effect because again, these are PMC jobs. It, it has this secondary effect of credentializing and professionalizing anti-racism as a practice. And essentially making it into an elite consumer good that some people can't afford. And you know what that means is that all of those poor people, there's no way they could be anti-racist. Look, I got the certificate. I got the, I passed the course. Uh, and why would we ever trust these elite institutions to even be able to administrate something like that when they are major factors in like, you know, the academy, the corporate world, they're historically major factors in the production of racism. I mean, Charles Murray has a degree. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I mean, but uh, my boss is my friend, and he wants me to be unracist because he likes me, and he thinks it would make my life better. I, I will say that something that validates the author's uh, uh, thesis here is that for the vast majority of people, having to go to an em employer-mandated uh, anti-racism workshop you're just going to turn your brain off for four hours and just try to not be involved to whatever degree that you can kind of like how girlfriends have to act when there's a new martin scorsese movie <laughs> out on a streaming service uh which means that the only people that she ever really interacts with are the people who get really indignant about the workshops because they don't have the social skills to just be like, oh, this is a bullshit thing. All right, whatever. Yeah. And just zone it out. Mm. Because all the people in her book are just people with no chill whatsoever. Yeah. I, I I'm, just, I'm it, guessing, too, that she, like, uh, like obviously she's going to focus on those people who probably have, uh, let's, let's be honest, other, other social issues uh, that they're dealing they, with. All of them. Th all of them. Things <laughs> going on in their life. Because, again, well-adjusted people are just like, this is bullshit. Just keep your head down. Ava said she didn't feel seen. That's... <laughs> Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that, a weird that, person. That Ava was uh, Ava Braun, by the way. That was Ava Braun. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, one of the worst. Um, uh, by the way, the one chapter I read about uh, anti-blackness, uh, or or no, I it was the next chapter. I just noticed that one of the women in one of the a- anecdotes is actually named Karen. You, there was there was another anecdote where um, she was brought in by a company to help them do a diversity, and they said, you know, the last anti-racism workshop we did uh, left people traumatized. So. Why you know, are you okay. doing this? Anyone who's, anyone who's actually actively grappling with this sort of, you know, fucking event that your employer forces you to do uh, is basically going to be saying shit like that. Mm. So there was a recent Onion article, uh, white ally willing to do whatever it takes to make sure people aren't mad at him. And yeah. the dominant affect that I can detect is anxiety. And I think that's the grease between the two cogs of neoliberalism and algorithmic media. Anxiety is the modern product of this ancient conflict between trying to be a morally good person and living in, perhaps being complicit in, or feeling complicit in, a society that is, by virtually all measures, bad. And people try to treat this anxiety symptom with the same products of what is generating it. Uh, Buy this book, listen to this podcast, post the square, use the hashtag, don't use the hashtag, whatever. Within this framework, you're going to get grifters and quack salvers multiplying because people are seeking an easy solution to an intractable problem. You can take an aspirin to treat your headache, but there'll still be a malignant tumor in your brain. And because all this is being worked out publicly for the consumption of others, and because we all have the tumor, treating your own symptom usually just exacerbates the symptoms of everyone else. And although there isn't anything per se wrong with taking the aspirin, in my opinion, if your only concern is treating the symptom, you'll never cure the disease. This is a, uh, this is a, a snake oil. It's a placebo. Uh, it, but the thing is, placebos work. So it's fine. Yeah. Uh, until you don't have to think about racism again. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like if, if you're reading this and you're and it's making you feel like you have transcended these categories uh, that you have for just the moment you're reading it, uh, uh, burnished, burned off the the taint of racism, then you're gonna feel better about you're yourself. Taking, you're taking painkillers after surgery. And, you know, the next time you have surgery, you'll take the painkillers again for most people. Uh, But some people just get addicted to the painkillers and then they become involved in the white fragility MLM scheme. Yeah, One of the chapters that I read was about uh, beyond the good, bad binary. And the argument is, is a lot of people reject the idea that they have racial insensitivities within them because they have defined themselves as good. And racism is a bad thing. And since they're not bad, therefore, they can't be racist because racism is, you know, an overt act as opposed to an attitude. That's the way that that's and, and her whole and she writes a whole chapter saying, no, that's not not correct. But the entire premise of the book is that, yeah, you can be good or at least better by reading the book. 